We do not seek the destruction of any government, nor do we covet a foot of any territory. We do not want an expanding struggle with consequences that no one can perceive, nor will we bluster or bully or flaunt our power. But we will not surrender. Hey guys, welcome, welcome, welcome. It's time for that game that you've been waiting for for so, so long. That's right, it's time for East versus West. I hope that you're finally, finally here and you're wondering, my God, is this actually getting underway? You're actually looking at the game right now. You're looking at East versus West in all its glory. My name's Matt Oving. I'll be your producer for tonight. And I will be introducing you to our, our friends, our, co our mutual friends here on our stream. See who they are. We're actually we have two guys that are from the development team. We're gonna go and try to uh, see where they are and whether or not they will want to join us here tonight. Gentlemen, are you with us? Well, yes, well, 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 yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> so, my name is Leonard Dirk, as you can see, and this is Galat. Galat Kastash. We're developers of East vs. West. Yeah. And we're going to introduce you to the game in its current state. Yeah. And uh, we gotta say that uh, to, to all the viewers, um, it, it is, we're an alpha, so if you see any pink rabbits or something like that, they will be dealt with without mercy. So just have a word and <laughs> we'll deal with them, yeah. Um, uh, but now, let's get to something more important and uh, maybe uh, like. Matt mentioned, this is a game about the Cold War, and that has some interesting implications, because as you all know, the Cold War was basically, um, many, many people would argue, uh, the greatest social experiment in, in, in our lifetime. Why? Because first time, humanity did not. It opted for the best solution, and it did not destroy itself. No wars, no major wars were fought, and we actually survived. Uh, are you wearing a radiation suit? Uh, only at home. Only at home, yeah, you see. So we have this option thanks to the fact that the Cold War remained cold. Um, which, um, well, l let's, let's, let's show them the game, Matt. Let's, uh, let's start them. You ready? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, to Paradox players, I mean, this seems very familiar. You see a map, you see countries, and you see scenarios, of course. Uh, in our game, we are offering six scenarios. Um, the first one starting in 46, and the last one starting in 1991, being the Gulf War. And in between, we have the Afghan War, the Vietnam War, the Korean War, the Arab-Israeli War, and of course, yeah, the beginning of the Cold War. This is the grand campaign scenario, but you can pretty much play all of them if you want to. And. Um, uh, this is also the screen where you get when you're playing the 32 player multiplayer, of course. And then you'll see the players just racking up here, everyone picking their own country. Um, so, yeah, for, for those who have played Paradox games before, it will be a sort of a familiar scene, but uh, also you will see that the scale of it is, is absolutely massive. I mean, the number of countries we have is is uh, is absolutely staggering uh, especially the, when, when we get uh, into um, the, the later stages as well when when all the colonies fall and we get a, a lot of new nations forming um, we also got to say that well basically we fuse the, the, the concepts of uh, 
uh, taken from previous games as it is a hard surviving game but it is a standalone game and uh, we get a lot of questions about that is, is this hard surviving 4 no it's not hard surviving 4 it's east versus west it's a it's it's um the paradox development studio concept taken one step further and as you see elements of this uh, for example you can see up here this is the doomsday clock and uh, yeah, now you go, well, well, what's the Doomsday Clock? It, it sounds sort of more like something taken out of a James Bond movie, right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I guess Goldfinger, he just wishes he had something like this. And, and this, is, this is actually real. And there is something called the Bulletin of Atomic Sciences. And basically it's uh, scientists uh, would pr that have been prominent members there, including Einstein and others. And uh, they every year re release sort of a state on how close humanity is at destroying itself, of totally annihilating itself. <clears throat> and um, and yeah, it's it's basically a clock that ticks down to to midnight. And and when the clock strikes midnight or or noon, depending on what part of the world you're in, but midnight. Then it is midnight for everyone. It's midnight for everyone. Yeah. Then. Uh, then, then, lucky us, we have the radiation suits. <laughs> um, so, uh, all right, uh, let's start. Uh, I'm going, oh yeah, uh, I, I, let me show you what I, I'll be demoing the Arab-Israeli war. And uh, for those who don't know, let me give you some background. Well, Israel was formed uh, uh, in 1948, and uh, basically it didn't exist before that. It was, uh, it was under British rule but they declared independence in 48 and uh, they created their own nation and as you see what I do is I pick the scenario and then when you pick a scenario you sort of for each scenario you get some uh, well interesting to play nations. yeah exactly that thank you Leonard. Uh, so interesting nations to play or central players I mean you can basically pick anyone like I could pick uh, you know play with China instead if I wanted to or uh, Communist China here, for, for, the, for that matter, or I can pick, you know, uh, Bulgaria. Um, but um, for this particular scenario, uh, the interesting one uh, to play is, is, of course, these nations. Um, because they sp play a specific role during this uh, time in history. So let's pick uh, Israel and um, I'll start up the game. Um, All right, um, so what's our concept of history while well, it's loading? Let me tell you a little bit about that. Uh, so our concept of history is uh, really, we don't want to say that our version of history is the correct one. Um, the reason for that is we want to supply the player the tools. We want to set up the world with a historical content and then you as the player, you decide where you're going to take history. And, and this has been a concept uh, which, which we expand on a lot and um, which we discussed a lot with Leonard about how to immerse the player into the great dramas of the past. Um, because at the end of the day, it's the player that has to make the choices. So we don't want a storyline that's that always plays out as history should because the player should be the one deciding when things happen and how they happen. Um, so history is at your hands uh, and, and it is a customizable world as with most Paradox games you, it's, it's freely moddable so you can change the content in it if you want to so it's, it's, it's really up to you um, what you do in the game and what you do with the historical content that we set up. So okay, uh, as you see here, we're starting in a kind of in a bad position. There's a, in the game we have DEFCON, and for those who don't know what DEFCON is, it's a representation of a nation's readiness for war, basically, and how close the alertness level of, an, of a specific nation. 
And we, as you see here, it says war, DEFCON 2. We are at war, and we are at war with uh, Palestine, in fact. So we go to DEFCON 2, and you see the DEFCON system represented here with the different lines. So, uh, of course, it goes from this blue one to an uh, actual white one, which is DEFCON 1, where nuclear war is, is imminent. Now, we don't have nuclear weapons as Israel, but, yeah, that's basically how the, the, the base system works. All right, um, so let me introduce a little bit more about what we actually see here for those who, who have never seen Paradox Games before. Um, so we have a world map and uh, you can see that here and you can pick countries and see, look at provinces and um, in Paradox Games there are different map modes you can choose between so you can look at for example the weather here oh it rains over Japan sweet um, there are other things you, you, you would be interested in more strategical ones for example you have different resources on the map that's important as you see here we have oil in the Middle East as should be um, we have other important stuff materials we have fish yeah um, we also have um, other things that might be of interest for example we have a diplomatic map mode as we see here we are Israel and we're at war with uh, Palestine so and we have bad relations with Syria Iraq and well our neighbors they they don't seem to like us that much for some reason <laughs> Uh, we're, we don't seem to be a welcome in the Middle East. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> they're, not la they're not laughing here, but... <laughs> um, so, uh, then we have the main menu here, and let me show you that. So we have politics, and each nation has a specific type of politics. And in politics, there are different parts, um, which, uh, which I, I will explain. And, and the main thing starts out with the fact that we have different parties, and you can see that here. And parties have sort of different popularity, and depending on what parties are popular, we hold elections, and then depending on the outcome of the elections, the parties will get into power and form a specific type of government. And you can ban parties, you can outlaw them, you can support them, and they all have different... Um, things that they bring with them. Like, for example, if you support a party, I mean, uh, it, it creates dissent it, because people think, well, you shouldn't be influencing the party politics where you yourself are in government. And in the game, you actually play the nation. Um, so you play the entire nation. And, and as a nation, you have a specific people. And you can see that represented by a specific culture. So we have a Middle Eastern country, we have a religion, we have an identity. Right now it's territorial focus, of course, because we want to keep the territories we just got. I mean, mm -hmm. um, and then you have an attitude. And right now we have a defensive attitude. We want to defend the territory. And then, of course, we have uh, our, our laws, which, uh, which are in different categories ranging from like civil liberties to you know military service and then the laws they are they are hard to change they are not that easy to change uh, whilst for example your culture is pretty much almost impossible to change because you have the the culture you have um, and then there's a park which is quite easy to change and that's the policies and then each government brings new policies with it and and you can influence that by just changing so for example if we want to be changing I don't know our military policy we just click it and then pick a new one now uh, you must fulfill different um, you, you can't just freely pick anyone you must fulfill the um, requirements for them so and and as you see right at the moment we're sort of stuck with the two-year service but that should be fine for us um, and then we have a head of state and the head of government. Um, and at the moment, you are not seeing any bonuses for them. And there is a reason for this. And uh, we're going to be introducing something, Lennart, called We Are the World. Definitely. But its main goal is actually 
to give ahistorical choices. Because in the Cold War we have, of course, the historical choices, the people that were el actually elected and the people that tried to be elected. But we have a lot, lots and lots of countries where there was only one leader and no opposition ever formed. And we have different kinds of parties that we try to simulate for them and for that we kind of need persons that should re represent them. Yeah, and what better, uh, we at the development team, we sat down and uh, we, we have worked uh, very hard to bring you something that's uh, kind of rare and that is we, we would like to be launching this campaign called We Are The World and you might have seen it in the forums and people were for a long time wondering what is this We Are The World campaign and the design idea of it is to let the player impact the content of chosen key elements in East versus West while the game is still in development. So what we're doing is uh, by this gr we are growing and progressing the, um, the interactivity between us and, and the gamers and we give the opportunity for gamers to enrich and develop the, the, the game and basically what we are offering is that we will be launching every month a certain set of countries and we will be allowing players to create their own avatars which will be which will be added in the directly into the game so by creating the avatars you will be putting we will be putting them directly into the game with your image for example we want if you ha if you want to put in an image of yourself and become a national leader you can do that and we have two types of national leaders we have the head of state and the head of government and what we're doing is we're offering, therefore, the opportunity for you to create your own avatar and be in, an a in the actual game. And you can create as many as you want, as long as you create like a backstory for them and, um, and, and you sort of create, uh, um, you choose which party they belong to and, uh, well, everything that, that a national leader has. Um, yeah, well, I, I just th think it's quite important to say that, I mean, if you are too young, then at least imagine your dad or your grandfather's image in the game. Like, he's a representative of the communist in uh, France. Yeah, but there are exceptions. Like, for example, the young king, right? Like, the, the leader of the Tibetans, you, you know, the Dalai Lama, he was, he was very young when he was, <laughs> he was chosen as the Dalai Lama. So, so uh, now if you're... 12 years old, yeah, you, you could probably be another Dalai Lama, <laughs> so it, it, it is possible, but yeah, uh, so, and, and if you want to put on your crazy hat, you know, and look like a Soviet leader, or you just happen to have this particular top hat at home, I mean, yeah, just put that on, take an image, upload yourself, uh, create the back, uh, back story, have uh, the background story, have, and, and then you pick between the traits, because we have specific traits chosen out and um, yeah create your own leader um, so uh, that pretty much explains we are the world I guess <laughs> so it was one of the major hush hush secrets but uh, you, can, you can just go to the forum the forum is open now so you can read the rules and the details there yeah it, it, it should be it should be up and uh, there are details about this uh, about how you do and what you do so um, all right um, hey, look, I actually have a national decision. Geneva Convention. Hmm. Shall I adopt this, Leonard? What are the requirements? Yeah, I will ratify the fourth Geneva Convention. It will give me... Oh, okay. I'll get... But what are the, what are the prerequisites? Uh, there are none? Mm, there, uh, well, we, so this anyone the can end do of the this? Yeah, anyone can do this. Ratify the Geneva Convention. It, should, it is free for everyone to do. Of course, probably this has some repercussions, and I am going to. Okay, okay, yeah. Let's let's be honest, guys. Hey, let's ratify it. Let's see what happens. Sign the Geneva Convention. Define humanity protection for civilians. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, sure. Let's do that. Cool. So we ratify sign the Geneva Convention. Probably will prevent me from doing nasty things. Um, all right. So. I talked a little bit about the politics. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be moving on and showing you a little about a little bit about the economy. 
So this is the economy screen and as you see uh, we have expanded the economy quite uh, a lot and basically what you see in the economy screen is um, your your then that will allow you to further your country you can get tech you can get armaments you can well fund your military and now as you see we're a poor nation at this point we're we're so poor man oh we're poor uh, we're, we're running we can't even break even yeah we, we don't even break even so and that's because we're a small nation so we can't be spending anything on anything basically look hey I, I get a positive balance though if I pretty much don't spend on no social spending people don't get daycare or anything we must protect our country first <laughs> hey uh, all right so also we have different uh, factories and the way this works is that each region and let me show you that so each region in uh, is divided up oh we actually have a specific building there oh, financial district cool in Jerusalem all right so uh, the way it works is each district uh, or region is divided up and then uh, when you build buildings they will be built in that specific region and so it utiliz utilizes the population of those specific uh, provinces and let me, I, can, I can show you that as well because this is something new for people who have played the previous Hearts of Iron games and have not seen East versus West before so in East versus West we have introduced population um, and the way it works is that as you see here we um, basically have um, divided up the population into different uh, domestic age groups yeah exactly and they range from age 0 to age 85 that's the oldest one uh, and then you see the different uh, um, yeah. age groups yeah. and and, and this also means that you have people that are of, you know, school age, and you have those that need elderly care, and you have those that are of military age, which are interesting for us. And those are the ones that we are recruiting, and they make out our manpower, which we see up here. And manpower is used, so each manpower is, is a thousand soldiers that can be recruited into your army. And if we look at our army here, for example, here we have a, a brigade, the Hativa uh, Negev. So th these are infantry, and basically they have 3,593. So this is four man, roughly three and a half manpower or 3.6 manpower. And and you will also see that units are different from many other games, and, and that is that we have divided up. Mm -hmm. Try to select the uh, tank unit, so people uh, can all right. see. All right, let me show you the tank unit. Um, here we have a tank unit, so, hey look, we have Sherman tanks, Sherman tanks, uh, right, uh, so here we can sh show it a bit better, so, right, what we have is um, divisions, so divisions are the smallest uh, unit in East versus West, in that, um, in that the division is made up of brigades but on the map you see them division wise and so you build your divisions and I, can, I will show you that in armaments but the mo mo most important point we're trying to show here is that we have divided up the unit strength and we make a difference between manpower and equipment and this is radical in, in that now you can actually destroy a tank equipment that is the tanks but the tank drivers, the manpower, will still be able to hide behind it and survive. So you need to have a specific type of weaponry to be able to defeat tanks. And that also matters for countries that have very low income. Because you can equip pretty much anyone with a gun and send them into combat. And it's not really expensive. And if, if he gets killed, another one can pick the gun up and continue fighting. Hey! But here we have now equipment that can be destroyed so as soon as the equipment is destroyed that costs money yeah because people are basically for free yeah this also means if you have a small population and you you're low manpower I mean because what could happen is for example if you're plowing manpower into things right and you send your units out and 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 they die like for example uh, China has this I mean they, they it's a bloody mess and and, and 
millions die. What, what will happen is that you will see every time a soldier dies, someone in your province actually dies that belongs to that specific unit. Then what will happen is after a while you will be seeing the demographics be drained of, well, working f because the people there are young they're not only in your army of course they're also working in your f working in factories so you're using the same pool of population uh, I, I guess if we let, switch let, to let me switch to my PC here uh, yeah you, you you can show the demographics Matt can we see my PC yes Leonard can show you how it looks so so I, I just press the letter where we have all the important information and as you see I am now the United States in 1946 and we have had quite some baby boom here as you see there are a lot of children and this is kind of the statistics now for the entire country but of course as you have seen Gellert you, you can select each province and look at the details of that province so we actually have quite a detailed demographic available and of course that also influences the cost of social spending because in social spending we have the cost of schools and the cost of pensions so it really matters how many people die and what age group they are so if you have have been in a huge war then you can rest easily the pensions will be cheap yeah and and it's not only about military i mean you, you can show them that out i i don't want to i don't want to put my people in the uh, in the reserve pool but you can probably show uh, how that works so so when you fought a war right in in most um most of the time you would you would not have a standing army you would not have you know 10 million troops standing by so what you will do is you would send the population back to work in the factories but you would still keep the equipment in a reserve pool and that's actually this group here, where we can easily sort between YAN unit, air units, whatever we want to be able to show. And this is all only equipment. So what we do is we place the equipment on the map, and then manpower will be given to it. Yeah, so, so you sort of, uh, what, what you have is mm, you mobilize your troops by s sending them out on the, ac the actual field. So. Uh, equipment that you're not using will be stored for you for when it's time to use it which also leads to the fact that you can free up manpower for your economy and you're going to be needing that as you saw it's it's not particularly economically sound to to like like you saw with Israel I have I have a large army and it's pretty <laughs> but but perhaps you can also show not that you're in production uh, land units the production of land units well, before we get to that, I think I want to show one tiny feature here, and that's actually the small statistics you have on this screen. Because it's kind of, this screen is kind of important when you want to deploy, so that you also see the current state of affairs. Right, right now I can see I have 49 land divisions already deployed, and 270 naval divisions, 226 air divisions. Hey, Captain! <laughs> <laughs> and we can also see our nuclear forces, like how many ICBMs, how many SLBMs and how many strategic bombers are loaded with nuclear bombs and ready to go. So this is kind of a quick overview of our, your current forces when you are on this screen. But let's take a look at land forces, like you said. I mean, uh, those of you familiar with Hearts of Iron will, of course, remember these brigades. But what we, have, what we have done here is that we built division templates as a default. And you can actually change the template if you don't like it, like I have a National Guard here, but I'm expecting heavy air resistance, so I would like an anti-air brigade added to it. So I could just go to custom unit, go to the, where is it, the long range anti-air, let's add that one, apply, and from now on it's added to it. Yeah. So you can actually customize the unit you want, how you want them. Yeah, and you also see your theaters there on the right side, right? And 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 that that shows sort of what your generals would like you to have, so that they they have they make a request for this is this is what we want you to have, and then then you, know, you can you can of course if you want to you can build those units, but if you think well your your generals you know, you know that five year of academics in uh, in those military academies were just a waste of time, then you build something that, that you would like. 
Um, all right, so maybe you can show something else, like uh, naval construction. Uh, you, can, you can build that, uh, like just just click production. Yeah, just start, start production with that. Bing, and, and now it's on the bottom, getting produced. Yeah. So when you hover your mouse over it, then then you you, you see what type of unit it is, and then what what it holds, and then you can deploy it to a specific theater. When the when the need arises, yeah. yeah. And you see also here the to the theater needs with all the units added. Because if you go to uh, naval and air, you can actually see the theater need for, in this case, ships, or if you go into the air designer, you will see for air units. So you always know what kind of units is suggested that you have. Yeah, for those who have never played this game, type of game before, and uh, for those who have uh, not seen uh, our news on the forums, uh, we have added, s th this is something only found in East versus West in that r regard when it comes to Paradox games, and this is um, uh, a customizable shipbuilder. Yeah. And as you see here, I've selected the Iowa class, and it has three heavy guns, and one, two, three, four, five medium multipurpose sized guns, and four anti air guns. Of course, if you hover over it, you will see an image of it, and this is a 16 inch Mark 7 heavy naval gun. Now, these are nice guys with 20 kilometers range, 14 sea attack, and actually some uh, sea defense, because they can uh, protect you from ships entering your zone of influence. But I can also select the Midway class carrier, where we have some aircraft here, the McDonnell F2H Banshee Multiroad Aircraft CAG. Yeah, and of course you can switch these around. You also have, like, missiles you can launch on and st stuff like that. I mean, it's... There you just yeah, there are different kinds of ships for different kinds of missions. Like you see here, we have some with to torpedoes, submarines, and helicopter carriers. I mean, we have, for each kind of ship, built a template which you can modify and specify what you want on it. But we're not going to show all the details yet. <laughs> And of course we have uh, radar ranges, those are very important later in the game. Maybe you can show you on the map perhaps, uh, do you, uh, you probably have some ships, uh, I guess, on the map already. Uh, what are you thinking? The, the radar... Uh, we, we're too early. Yeah, I know, you just... Um, the intel map, I mean? That's a tiny radar dot. Oh, radar. I know, yeah, yeah, it's 1948, okay. On the side, no, no, uh, no guys, i got a question for you. Can you build a Montana if you want to? Which is the Iowa follow-up, but was never built. Uh, that, that's an interesting question. We get a lot of model questions. Uh, can I build this? Can I build that? And uh, the answer to that is we have, uh, we have opted for building everything that was officially built until 1991. And that's what's going to be in, uh, the, well, in, in the main game. Um, for for the majors, so, but that that also means that for most historical countries will actually have the blueprint of the ship, yeah, how it actually looked and where the components were placed, where the guns were, and yeah, how and big the, the guns you can actually mount on it. Yeah, and the actual components. So so we have uh, maybe I can show you some of the tech if we switch to that. Let's 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 show some of the tech, and we can also explain how uh, the 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 idea behind the tech system. All right, so the idea behind the tech system is different from many uh, f from from previous um, titles, and that is we've changed some things around that uh, have altered heavily how the tech system works. And basically, uh, I can show you by clicking on a tech. So what what happens is each tech is 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 sort of a component. Uh, like for example the light engines here but you don't have to research it 10 times so what happens is if you research light engine then it gives you already have the light engine required for a lot of units so it gives you the bonuses for that so you don't actually start with tech because uh, what, what was important during the Cold War was the doctrines so you found you, you needed the role and then for example, it could it could be that you needed uh, mechanized warfare, and then when you research mechanized warfare, what you would have gotten is, for example, the heavy mechanized brigade, and now you have that specific role, and that will enable you to research the specific techs 
later on that are tied to that role so you can improve that particular uh, unit. This also means that um, you don't, you don't, for example, now if we take the light engine, if I now research the light engine, but I haven't enabled, let's say, one of the units, the rocket artillery regiment, for example, then what I will do, what will happen is I will have the engine already. So when I unlock it, then the engine will be there to be implemented, which means that uh, as you progress in research, you actually progress more than one unit. So uh, even though you're not using that unit, at that particular moment uh, and you reach to a new theater where you might need that specific unit then you have that in store and you can implement that by just researching that specific unit um, so for example uh, if we go to uh, maneuver warfare this has the light mechanized and the armor brigade for example um, now that will unlock that we can research some specific uh, guns or it could be artillery or it could be missiles uh, yeah depending on what you pick and it's the same thing with ships so what you do is you pick a particular role let's say here uh, this is for carriers um, if I pick uh, th this is I'm playing Israel's here so I've stolen some some stuff from the the, the US and from the British so if I want the coastal fleet doctrine, I can get the missile boats and then I can research things that are connected to the missile boats. Um, for example, here we have the missile boats. And of course, as you see, there's a lot of tech to cover. So we have a small feature edit that will ease uh, to reach a goal in the later stage of the game. Yeah, and that's, that's goals. And what, you, what happens is when you click goals and you pick a specific goal for example missile boats here then what it will do is it will uh, it will pick all the the requirements to it and then the AI will research that for you as it becomes available so or you can just use it to see which which uh, takes a high priority at the moment exactly because because as you see here it, it lists all the pre-requirements it, it shows which are unaccessible and which are accessible uh, so that you can easily maneuver around in the tech system because we, we know that the tech system uh, is complex but that's what we, we want uh, complexity because it's it the, it stretches over a long period of time and we want the enough amount of complexity so that we don't have a washed out tech system but instead we have a rich tech system where you can pick the particular units you want to so solve the, the type of mission that you uh, assign. All right, but let's show some combat. Before we before we go ahead, by the way, um, yeah. on this end of the spectrum, you have these sort of things, but on the other end of the spectrum, can Poland go into space? Sure. Uh, in fact, I mean, my, many don't know, but the Kazakhs were the ones who went into space first. I mean, the, the Baikonur is in Kazakhstan, in fact. And uh, yeah, they can. Uh, it's it's only about applying enough money and building your economy well, right? Uh, of course, it's gonna be a lot of money, so um, and a bit space for the launch side and basically yeah. peace for a long time. Yeah, we have something called a spaceport, and you have to actually build a spaceport to be able to launch yourself into space. And then what happens is that you can research if if we go to the space things. Uh, I mean, you just see here the, the goal requirements for different, like the moon landing. Uh, you need quite, it would take you 754 months, and the estimated cost will be 2,550. I mean, it will take you a long time uh, to, to get there, basically. Cool. Poland in space confirmed. <laughs> yeah, Poland in space confirmed. Uh, we cannot guarantee that Cuba will go into space, but uh, if you manage your economy, you know, anything's possible. All right, continuing with Israel. Right. Uh, so, uh, we showed a little bit about armaments, we showed a little about tech. Um, we should, uh, before we go into the war specific part, let's talk about diplomacy. Diplomacy is, of course, a very important part, and there are... Um, 
Uh, the Cold War is, is sort of very special as well, because it has an entity that, that's, uh, that, that is um, unique, and that is the United Nations. So the United Nations is a gathering of member states, and basically the United Nations can do a lot of things. They can do embargoes, sanctions, nuclear arms embargoes, all, all sorts of stuff really. And, um, and many people ask us, well, what can I do as a small nation? Am I doomed, you know, to basically be a slave under the others? And, and, and the answer to that is no. You, you can join the United Nations and then use diplomacy to your advantage. Uh, and in diplomacy, we use something called the bias system. Um, Lenart, you, you want to... Yeah, I'm try, try to switch my screen again, and I'll talk a bit about it. Uh, yep. So now you see, I'm uh, United States again. And as we see here, many of the nations actually have a small uh, flag here. And that is the bias of that country, what it will vote for. Now, uh, what that means is that if you have enough prestige and influence within that region, people will start to vote like you. And this kind of builds up as a hierarchy, which is represented here in biases, where you can see like France actually has two countries voting for it. The United Kingdom has 16, which basically means that as soon as the United Kingdom makes a vote, it will actually get 16 other countries to vote just like it. So even as a minor, you can actually build up your sphere of influence and thus make the UN work for you and get your own ideal through. So there's really no limitation on the size of your country. Instead, of it, it is about applying your diplomatic influence well and uh, having good relations with other, other nations, not be a warmongering nation, because then you will have other nations turn against you. Yeah, all right, so if we switch back to my screen. All right, so now you're wondering, uh, wow, cool, so battle plan. Yeah, we added the battle planner. Um, basically, what you can do is, um, this is the perfect tool. I don't, I don't know if anyone tried multiplayer, but it's, it's really hard to explain in multiplayer what to do. And we added the battle planner as a tool for you, for multiplayer as well, um, to be able to govern your units and but also drop maps and plans for how you want to be acting. So this is basically what we're going to do. We're going to take our tanks, we're going to take it into Jenin here, and um, uh, we're going to be invading the Gaza Strip, and we're going to be holding off against the Golan Heights and against uh, uh, the Lebanese here. Because obviously, uh, I don't want neither Egypt nor the other ones invading me, and and so um, just delete the plan. Um, yeah, we can set. We know what the plan is, so let's set that into motion. We are moving our troops. Um, I'll be moving those down there, and I'll be taking Ashdod as well. All right, let's uh, let it run. See what happens. If we get pulverized or not, let me increase the speed somewhat. Oh, yeah, started the attack. Um, so you can show here. Basically, uh, we're doing combat. Uh, we see that we have. Oh, what leaders do we have? Oh. Oh boy, we are badly running out of money. Mm, better suspend the factory that's making a loss. Well, war is expensive, so... I'm just hoping we pull through. Uh, the more we capture, though, might the better. Let me... Okay, and Battle of Janine. Uh, 
All right, so, uh, okay, it might be wise to cover Bear Chevalier. And Haifa. Try to take Gaza, can't take Gaza. Alright, while well, this is going on. Oh! New weapon and volunteers. Oh, I badly needed this. The war against the Arab states started only recently, but regardless, we must reorganize our troops and continue military training if we are to survive. Luckily, a lot of Jewish volunteers from many foreign countries decided to join our cause, among them also a member. Veterans from World War II, yeah! Also, the Jewish agency has managed to smuggle weapons and ammunition to Israel, mainly from Eastern Europe, the Arab states. Cool! Yay, we're getting fuel and some troops. Let's see what's that. The Mahal. Uh, right, oh! Cool, so let's incorporate that into our army here. We get the Mahal. Ah, we get two fresh divisions. That's perfect. It's exactly what we need. So now we can do a fresh offensive against Janine here. And yeah, let's cancel that and go to Gaza. Can't go to Gaza. Mm -hmm. Why can't I do that? Uh, oh, okay, I'm, they're just waiting for fuel to reach them. Capture that. And then we can attack. Attack commenced. Captured Gaza. Right, uh, I made a breakthrough. Oh, hey, look at that. An embargo. Voting target was People's Republic of China, initiated by the USA. Huh. Yeah, uh, we can talk some about the factions and describe perhaps something about the factions. As you've seen here, NATO popped up and there are two major factions in the game. It's Warsaw Pact and, um, and, the, uh, and NATO. Yeah. Um, maybe you, you want to describe what they, they are? I mean, for those who don't know what the Warsaw Pact and NATO are, they are basically large alliances that were formed during the Cold War. Uh, NATO, of course, uh, in the West, and then uh, Warsaw Pact in the East. Um, and it was a cooperation between different countries, and what happens is when you start the game, um, the, 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 the factions haven't been formed yet. So it's the United States uh, and uh, the Soviet Union that forms the different factions. Um, you, you want to perhaps show that? or? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, if you go to my screen again, I've clicked Diplomacy, and you can see here on the organizations that we have, many nations are part of the United Nations, and we have two countries part of NATO and Warsaw Pact. And those nations that are part of a faction unlock the faction tab here. Now what, what happens inside the faction tab is that, let's say that the uh, well, let's say I want to embargo Brazil. Uh, if I did the diplomacy action and just selected Brazil, then I could, of course, embargo Brazil and that was it. But it's only me. But if you have, let's say, five or ten countries within your faction, then every faction member would do the same action as you. If yeah, the voting is accepted. Yeah, because it's an ideolo ideological struggle, right? So... Um, so it's a it's a fight it's it's sort of a fight for globally to be dominating and 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 those who make the decisions I mean the Soviet Union decides to form the faction and decides to form the faction with specific nations in mind um, of course those being in its particular sphere um, and then uh, and then de depending on um, depending on what course you want to take if you play these specific nations or if you play a nation that's within that specific faction then you can chose, choose how to go but there is this this unique feature with the, with the, the veto um, yeah I mean uh, some nations especially the 
major nation. They will actually have the ability to push this button. And that matters a lot when you talk about the United Nations. Because let's say that the US, like you saw before, wanted to vote for an embargo for one of your allies, if you are the Soviet Union. Then of course you wouldn't, wouldn't want that to happen. But if you don't have enough votes to tip the balance, you can opt to choose, choose vetoes. Stop the decision altogether, but at the same time you're going to make your position in the future weaker than it is right now. Because of course you are limiting other, there are most people's choices of what can be done. Yeah, I made a horrible mistake here. And somehow the Palestinians have invaded Jerusalem. <laughs> 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 I'm getting horribly murdered here. That's bad. Yeah, right. That, uh, that was not a good thing. <laughs> on a side note, when we were talking uh, politics and that sort of thing, how is, is the Marshall Plan represented in any way in the game? Oh, the Marshall Plan is sort of like a Lend-Lease uh, variety. Um, but uh, most of all, it, it will be a decision. So you will launch the Marshall Plan if you have enough, uh, if, if you have enough uh, resources to be able to launch it, then you will launch it. It's, it's sort of a scheme that you can launch uh, as uh, the United States. And, and the USSR, of course, has its own version of that, even though it's somewhat weaker. So it's, it's about rebuilding, basically. Like, like Leonard showed, the population, for example, in Germany is quite horrendous at this time, so the German factories will be working pretty scarcely, and you need to rebuild the country, and um, that will also be the case when we look at, for example, um, infrastructure in many countries is quite quite bad. Um, so infrastructure will need to be rebuilt. And in some countries, like for example, if you look at the infrastructure map here, this is the infrastructure map of Scandinavia. And some, a lot of Scandinavian countries even took martial help, even though they were not part of the actual war. So. Um, Right now, uh, Germany is still in green here, but uh, it will be more like France and Spain, um, where the infrastructure is kind of bad after uh, World War II. Um, so that's the, the basic idea. Yes, Lord? Yeah, and talking about the decisions, I mean, if we switch to my screen just a second here, that we have a definition of decisions here because if I go to politics we can see national decisions that means decisions that only affect you now you can see here I can launch the war games because I am yeah like the Geneva Convention we launched exactly yeah. so this is something that affects you and I can launch the war games now and get the event for that or I can go to, to diplomacy and see the international decisions and that is where you can see the Marshall Plan for that matter because this is what affects other countries like uh, if you want in the Arab Israel war you get decisions to intervene in uh, the Arab Israel war like sending supplies or actually in, uh, going into war with one of the other members and supporting them yeah and we also have a uh, regarding that we have a specific thing you can launch um, called defensive war uh, and defensive war is uh, is a concept where you decide to defend someone, but you lose the ability to attack. So, for example, if you play the United States and you decide, I want to protect, with every tooth and nail, I want to protect South Vietnam, then you can launch a defensive war for South Vietnam, which will mean that you as the United States, you have the ability to station troops within South Vietnam's core territory and defend them from aggression but you will not be able to wage war, uh, offensive wars you will not be able to, for example to be invading North Vietnam but you can defend their territory from being invaded and this way you can protect countries from getting lost to uh, someone more powerful it, it could be for example well China intervenes on behalf of North uh, Korea or it can be the United States intervening on behalf of, um, of um, uh, South Vietnam. And of course, doing a defensive mission is not as aggressive as actually joining the war and like crushing the North Vietnamese. <laughs> because no one would allow that. I mean, 
that would that would be way too aggressive. But, but you can launch your own private, well, let's say, protection. Like uh, a guerrilla war. Well, that, that's kind of something else. Okay. Because guerrilla war is, uh, well, guerrilla war, asymmetric warfare. Whereas yeah. this is kind of like com coming in with a hammer just to protect those stepping over a line. Yeah, uh, guerrilla war is 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 a different uh, concept in 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 general in East versus West, and uh, and and we uh, and that is represented by uh, guerrilla war units. We have um, uh, they are a bit different. Like for example, if we just switch over here and look at quickly the map of uh, Indochina, which supposedly is ruled by the French then we'll see that there are guerrillas t actually taking over the country as we speak and that's the Viet Cong um, it's really uh... try to switch to the political map there people can see what's taken what's not taken yeah here we go so here we have the French trying to protect Indochina and Indochina in itself is being invaded these are the regular North Vietnamese troops and then here we have the Viet Cong taking over South Vietnam um, so uh, we have different rebel movements you, you can see also here in China we have different um, rebels that have pop, popped up and I think oh look um, oh this is the rebellion in um, Indonesia also a, a rebel movement here taking over the country and this is a way where basically rebels can change your government they can either nationalist rebels can change the type of government you have can change your uh, um, your your leadership who like a coup but they basically take over your country um, uh, or, create, create their or, own. or create their own so uh, now here in the case of Indonesia they are trying to create their own uh, and creating Indonesia f because it is colonized at this point by the Dutch so they are trying to break free from the Dutch hey, yeah Matt like uh, yeah the Dutch but <laughs> they, they are actually losing this war so <laughs> because the Americans told us to give it up that's yeah that's right yeah, yeah that, that's a uh, <laughs> so um, and oh and here we also have the Indians and the Pakistanis fighting it out I see um, so whilst we've been uh, battering the poor Palestinians um, but so far the, they have held out pretty good uh, no one else has joined but I suspect that that would, would be but but I don't know how do we look at uh, time wise Matt? Uh, we've got about 15 minutes so we're gonna go and try oh do we have any yeah, qu more questions I'm gonna go and cover those right now okay yes so um, question number one this is a, a, a game that takes place between 1946 and 1991 uh, do you work from conflict to conflict? What do you do between conflicts, and how do you end a conflict? Whereas in Hearts Iron Three, it was uh, you s you start the build up of war, yeah. then there is war, the game ends. Oh, so like we described before, uh, this is a Cold War game, so it's it, it is you do fight proxy wars, so there are smaller wars, but it depends on what country you play. Really. If you sp play a smaller country, then you would like to further, you would like to in enhance your economy, but also your diplomatic standings. Because here, you gotta choose your weapon, right? And we give you the tools, and then you, 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 you pick what you want to be using. So if you're a small country, let's say in Africa, for example, I mean, if there are no bigger countries protecting your neighbors, you could be invading them. That, that could be one way to do it. But another way to do it would be, uh, for example, using spies, some uh, and uh, we 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 have spy cards that you're going to be using for that um and what will happen is you send away your spies and you basically try to foil the other one's plans you try to uh, create havoc in their country maybe uh, replace their government so they're friendly to you and um, then take take them over in, in a different kind of way but you can also dominate them economically you can do that by uh, for example embargoing them because embargoing a nation is horrendous especially if the U if you get the UN to embargo someone I mean they lose all their trading partners they they be, well you need friends in the game <laughs> let's 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 put it that way and uh, you gotta you gotta choose whom your friends are but also you're choosing who your enemies are in the game 
So, and this is happening, uh, yeah, during the whole course of the game. You, you, you gotta think ahead. What do I do next? What's my next move? What tools do I use next? Yeah, and of course, like we talked about now with the UN and the bias system, you can actually always measure your diplomatic score, I mean, your, your diplomatic power, yeah. so to speak. And winning the game is not about being the last survivor. I mean, uh, if I hover my mouse over a flag... Yeah, yeah, sure that, because... You can actually see here, like, uh, I have prestige of 7, and I get 7 a month. My economic rating is 9.5 out of 10, and the military rating, diplomacy rating. And with these ratings, I'm number 2 in the world. Now, that's not really good. I want to be number 1. Yeah, and, and we got to say that also in the faction. You have the opportunity. For, for example, now, Warsaw Pact is headed by the Soviet Union. But there is an opportunity. If you, Let's say you're playing Communist China, and you want to be ruling uh, the Warsaw Pact. Then what you got to do is you join the Warsaw Pact, and then if you become more powerful than the Soviet Union, for some reason, let's say the USA invades so the Soviet Union, I don't know, it collapses or it's mishandled, then you can actually take over the faction by becoming the most powerful one, then you make the decisions. In a second. Before we go to that, let's... Yeah, let's, let's finish up the questions before that, and then we'll yeah. wrap up with that particular thing. Because I want to show you a small thing called victory conditions, which is to see how it's going with the factions. Now, as you see here, it's kind of a close call right now between NATO and Warsaw Pact. Six percent of the world's economy, military, and diplomacy is actually in NATO, and five percent is the Warsaw Pact, which is me. And 89% are non-aligned. These are the countries I want to get into my faction. If I get those here, I win. At the same time, we can of course see my stats here, population, provinces, land units, air units, naval units. And I'm pretty good at all of them, but number th being number three isn't really my thing. I mean, only being able to show the largest amount of provinces isn't a goal in itself. And you see here, I'm number two in the world with 14 victory points, USA is number one with 20, and so on and so forth. I will never join you! I get the neutrality bonus. So yeah, <laughs> even, even the neutrals have... So, so you, you have... Um, if, if you decide to be neutral, you actually get... Uh, like, we can switch to, um, to my... And what we've done is with the strategic effects, uh, we have different goals. So, for example, you can pick to be neutral, and there is a... Um, there is a, an actual, you see now I am playing Israel, and I am neutral, and there, yeah, I get an advantage of actually being neutral, and uh, yeah, so if you join the faction, you will lose that advantage, so there are advantages and disadvantages of everything, and that's why you got to be thinking strategically. Perfect. Do what we have? Yeah, yeah, speaking of strategically, um, thinking strategically, what sort of resources are on the map? Oh, um, if we go to economy and to trade, uh, I can show you some of the resources there. So we have everything from different foods, fish and uh, grain, and then we have different natural resources, oil, coal, uh, renewable energy, um, and then we have energy kinds, uh, which are electricity and fuel, and these are sort of refined energy, if you want to call it that, and then we have stuff produced by factories which are consumer goods from light in the street to uh, you know computers services and can you incentivize these as well yeah because uh, some you produce directly on the map like I showed uh, with the resource map mode so they're produced on the map others you have to refine them to be able to get them and you do that by building specific like for example here if we take light industry actually produces light industry right so if we click on it, you see what it needs as an input and what it outputs. And then it employs people as well, which will make so that people get money and that will ri raise your actual consumption, which you see here in the, the previous mentioned sort of economy screen, the budget, if mm -hmm. you want to call it that. And, and you see here our income from production and services. And uh, right now we are running some research, so... Uh, research is a very expensive, I gotta say, so that's why we're running such a loss. And of course, our military upkeep. Hey, gotta have that at this point, yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaking of upkeep, if you have uh, a unit and you are not at war, do you need to store it in a supply depot? Can you take those 
can you take those um, those troops out of those units and bump them back into the economy while you're not on Yes, floor? yes, that's what we mentioned previously. Maybe, maybe I can show you how it works. So it's really easy. So, okay, it's, it's really stupid to do this now where you're at war. So, because it takes a while to, once you store, you send them back into the economy, it takes a certain while before you can put them before back again. Before mobilization is... Yeah, before, you can remobilize them. But it's sort of simple. You go here and you demobilize the unit. You can delete them and disband the unit completely, but uh, you just that's that's how you do it. And then it, it ends up in a deployment pool, and you see it here. And then you can just deploy it when the time's up. But I won't be able to until yeah August now again. Yeah. Um, can you sell a di uh, used stuff to other nations? Uh, yeah. Um, what you can do is old stuff that you have. You should you. Um, if you're not going to be using them, you're not going to be upgrading them, then um, you're going to be selling them. And this can be used as a strategy as well, because what you will do is you will, you can as a nation focus on specific things and not on something else. Like for example, it might be very expensive to get tanks, uh, you might be ignoring the tank tech, and then what, basically you will buy that from other units then. Okay, uh, let's say you are a Warsaw Pact nation, yep. and you super uh, you su supersede the Soviet Union as the no! most powerful nation. Does yep. that mean that you will become the leader of the Warsaw Pact? Yes, you will become the leader of the faction. Yes, that's that's exactly what what it what it means. And it, it it's regardless if you play Poland or if you play Cuba, if if you become more powerful, because it can happen. I mean, even with the U.S. The U.S. can break apart for, for one reason or another, and uh, yeah, then... The uh, South will rise again, basically, is what you're saying. <laughs> Could happen. <laughs> or it will all belong to Mexico, you know? Sounds very familiar. Uh, yeah, most, most people say, oh, it will all belong to Canada, but I didn't want to give our Canadian friends the benefit. But okay, I just did, so yeah, okay, all right. Speaking of, speaking of, you had a guy in the chat earlier who claimed he was Canadian. He was wondering whether or not you can uh, build the Avro Arrow in the game. <laughs> Considering that's such a, such, a, such a dodgy thing in the Cold War history. <laughs> well, we put in Quebec at least, so... Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, the Cuban Missile Crisis, it's currently not a starting point in the game. Is it a scripted event? Does it begin at some point? Are there particular... Yeah, let me, let me talk about the events and how that works. What we have is dynamic events. And uh, now people say, well, what, what's that? Well, it, it, it isn't linear in progression. So what will happen is we differ between decisions and events. So events are only things that happen, you know, where you, where surprise! You, yeah, surprise! You don't know about it. Like, oh, the stock market dropped. What an event! Random event. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, it's 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 more or less random, you know. But decisions are something else. So, for example, if you start in 1946, right, and you progress to 1950, it doesn't mean that at that specific date in 1950 the Korean War now goes a line and you know it start, starts this chain and then you end up in the Korean War what it does is when you meet certain condi conditions and cr criteria to if you involve yourself in Korea as the United States then what will happen is you will get a decision to do that mm -hmm. and then you will see what criteria you need to fulfill to actually go forward and launch that mm -hmm. but if you want to wait with that it's also possible. Well, it depends on the situation. Of course, if Korea then is is completely annihilated, then obviously the Korean War will not happen anymore. Right. The same happens with the Arab-Israel War. All yeah. the other nations have the option to intervene as long as that war is going on. Yes. If Palestine falls or if, if they get peace, then that event the, chain is gone. Yeah, that, that particular one. Um, until... Palestine rises again. Mm -hmm. So if let's say now Israel for some reason ends up in a war with, I don't know, Saudi Arabia, and then they release Palestine for, for what, whatever particular reason, then what will happen is Palestine is back. So nothing is really, you know, gone forever. And, and you can't wait, like for example, you can't be mean and just wait 
with launching the Korean War if, if you can hold out and then launch the Korean War and the Vietnam War at the same time. Then we'll get the U.S. player thinking, oh my god! Nixon will be proud. <laughs> Nixon will be proud. <laughs> um, on a side note, it's, it's a couple, uh, people are wondering about the guerrilla warfare, and specifically, um, can you, can you um, expedite a guerrilla warfare into a full-on proxy war as a major power? Can you, can you uh, support guerrillas with weapons, let's say if you're GRU or KGB, uh, KGB yeah. in the spy mode, can you push... What, what happens, we have to explain with guerrillas what happens, and that is uh, when... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you want to explain it? Okay, so when, when you... Uh, you can sponsor guerrillas, and when you approach them and you get up to the border, if, if we go to your... Well, you, ha you have to say that it only applies that if you are the sa in the same war. So let, let's imagine now the Vietnam War yeah, that you can, supported the Yeah, I can show here. So, so let's say you are in North Vietnam here and you have sponsored these uh, Viet Cong guerrillas. When, when your country links up with these, what will happen is that, that the fighters in that territory, in this territory here, they will join you. So you will gain those fighters and you will gain the territory that they have captured if you were the one sponsoring them. So the progress that the rebels have made will, will, will be yours. But that only happens when you link up your, uh, your territory. And there's, there's real danger now from the rebels because it's not like uh, some other games. They pop up, you kill them and it's gone. Now imagine that the rebels, as they spread the provinces, they start to increase the revolt risk. And the more they spread, the more the revolt risk spread, and there comes more and more of them. So you really have to be quick in turning them down, as they can actually fuel more. Yeah, I don't have any intelligence here, so I can't see what the revolt risk is. But yeah, basically, what, yeah. So even when you kill the units, the 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 units when they die, well, actually when they capture province, they will. Uh, they will ignite people's, uh, you know, fury there. They'll, they'll, they'll uh, create a guerrilla cell. Yeah, guerrilla cell. Yeah, you can, we could can, we can call it that. And that will hap what will happen is uh, it will add a bonus in that province. So guerrillas will spawn even fr more frequently there. So you can't basically let them... I mean, it, they, will, they will spread like cancer. Let, let, let's yeah. just say there's a reason why Cuba lost <laughs> the, to a specific guy up there. It's he had beard and you know a little hat and you <laughs> There's know a background smoking. Now as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I have two more questions before we uh, we finish off our stream. Yeah. Um, to what extent can you uh, can you help the guerrillas? Can you, for instance, give them a nuclear suitcase bomb if you want to? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> but you can give them military equipment, meaning supplies, and then the troops will fight better. They'll have better equipment to fight with. Yeah, and, and the, like we said, the rebels are not a pushover. I mean, they will be utilizing basically every trick in the book. Uh, and even though, uh, yeah, I mean, you, they're not easy to defeat. So it is a, it's going to be a, a yeah, difficult time. The real problem is that there, there's the aspect of time. Once guerrillas have been there, it takes time for, for them to disappear again. So you need to have troops there all the time to like protect you from insurgencies. Yeah, you will you will actually have police units for real now, not you know just one cavalry running back and forth <laughs> with the Soviet <laughs> Union. <laughs> so so yeah, it's it, they are they are not a pushover. In fact, uh, they they are quite powerful, uh, as you see here with uh, Vietnam. Uh, they are they are a pain in the ass. So. All right, one final question before we uh, head off. Yep. Ideology. Can can the uh, can the uh, Warsaw Pact turn into capitalist dogs, and can the United States and the NATO turn into the Red Scare? Yeah, theoretically everything's possible, and in fact, for example, if you are a country like France and you become communist, what will happen is that suddenly. The, the communists in France, they will start releasing your colonies because they don't really like the colonies. So this can, what, what that can do is, for example, it will um, enhance 
the fall of, of the colonies because we have three main stories in the game um, and perhaps we didn't mention this and we should have probably in the beginning but there are three main stories in the game one is um, of course the, the two factions the, the Warsaw Pact against NATO and then the second one is the fall of the colonies so you have the United Kingdom, Belgium, Portugal all of them starting to lose their colonies after the Second World War. So, and, and, and it's, it's going to be a challenge as, say, the, the UK player, if you want to keep your colonies, it will be hard. I mean, you will need to make uh, tough decisions about which colonies to keep and not to keep, because it will virtually be impossible to keep them all. Um, well, you will have to struggle with that. And then the third one is is the pan-arabism uh, idea and and this is and what what i showed you was actually the first beginning of that and that's the arab israeli war when they are they they, they start off so so these are the three main stories and they are interwoven into each other um, so so nothing is really isolated they all have uh, an impact on on each other okay so one more one more surprise last one Yep. Who kills JFK? We know that, but we can't tell you. Okay. <laughs> you would have to kill me. Snowden knows it as well. <laughs> <laughs> the man on the run. Yeah, he's probably... The yeah. man on the run. <laughs> shall, we, shall we initiate procedures? Let's try it. Let's try it. Um, I've selected the Soviet Union, and I've cheated a bit. I have chosen nationalist China oh, no. as my target. Because I like the Communist China so much, I want to help them out. So, I declared them war, and I cheated to get DEFCON 1. So, what I do is... I know what's coming, oh my <laughs> god. I select the nuclear map mode. Now, I hope people are not going to be offended in... <laughs> <laughs> well, the Chinese are hopefully not watching this, so... <laughs> there's a reason for choosing... <laughs> You chose the most populous nation on earth and <laughs> say that they're probably not watching this? Oh my god! <laughs> now, where is the population located now? <laughs> yeah, so our developers in China, uh, I, I, we love the fact that you guys have gone into the National Archives and uh, <laughs> gotten the information for us and uh, we are sorry for what about to will be, what about to be happening here. So we see that China has no warheads, they have nothing ready, so... I'm green to go. Oh, it's nationalist, then it's fine. So I can, I can uh, select some regions I want to hit, or I can select provinces, or I can just select the entire country. But I'll select some regions here to bomb. And now I need to assign some nukes, and as we assign nukes, we can see which target they're being targeted. We have econo economic points in that province, military points, and basically these points are a decision on when we want to target because I've selected more provinces now than I have nukes. So I can say I want to target economic targets. Okay, then I will select eight of the most economic targets within those regions. Or military, or just select the highest points and be done with it. Of course we also have like a submarine launched. If you had some uh, boomers here, they would be able to launch. If I had some strategic bombers within range, they would be able to fly there and bomb. Yeah, and boomers are cool because, of course, they can come really close. So the, the, the travel time for the nuke will be very quick. That's so that they, they don't have time to react. That's what we call a preemptive strike in this case. If they have nukes, then the silos will have take time to prepare and to be made ready to launch. Boomers are close by and are always ready. So you can actually bomb their silos before they launch, limiting their ability to retaliate. So that's the point of having strategic bombers and boomers. Yeah, but that's the danger of it uh, as well, yeah. Right. And of course, we can that hand here, let the AI handle it, but no, I want to press the big red button. Now what will happen is that as time goes by, we should be able to see... Whoop, 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 whoop. That was too quick. <laughs> <laughs> you just annihilated the... Oh my god. Oh, poor people. Let me pause the game. Wow. Actually... They don't have any population left. You killed everyone. 
some military buildings, there's no division, it's always kind of bad ah, hits here. And you see that one nuke can actually hit several provinces if it's not enough. And also you can see here, it was, it, I actually targeted him with SS3, Scheister, 3 megaton bomb, so... I should have done some damage here and there. You annihilated their entire population. Oh no! Oh, <laughs> it's so mean. I hope they will forgive me. He just, he just, he just several three megaton. <laughs> yeah, he just, he just, yeah, the, he just into the Stone Age. Castle Bravo would be so proud. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So, after this, what happens? Funeral, massive <laughs> funeral. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> oh, um, so what? We, as we said before, we are. Can you go to the population mode? Really? <laughs> Uh, I didn't hit that one. I hit that one. I mean, there's nothing left. So I think we need to tone those three megaton <laughs> bombs down a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like, like we said, we are in Alpha now, and uh, we are... Um, the, the plan is, of course, the betas. And, um, um, uh, yeah, what can we say more about that? Yeah, that's, uh, that's that, that is the plan. That, that's basically it. So, um, what we'll be doing is, uh, we have some uh, dev diaries lined up, and of course, uh, like we mentioned, uh, the We Are The World uh, event. Um, so, that's pretty much the, the, the plan that we have, and um, uh, as uh, Susanna said on the forums as well, we have a release time set for um, uh, f the first quarter uh, this coming year, so uh, we are looking forward to that, and, uh, and hope to see you all on the forums. Yeah, and we got we got to just say it to uh, to to our fans and the, the people in the forums. I mean, you guys are fantastic, uh, entertaining us with jokes <laughs> or like I, I I can't even say how much we we we, we enjoy that and uh, all 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 the 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 the, the, the hints and the, the, the tips we get and. Um, like, the, like, like there was this guy. We we showed an image of Korea, right? And then he said, "Well, that's not how Korea looks looked in 1946." Let me give you the map. And then he goes out and he gets all the data. Uh, it's fantastic. We 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 love the crowd. So, uh, thank you. Uh, we we really appreciate this this connection, and um, and we really cherish it. So, yeah, yeah, perfect. Well, guys, thank you all for watching here. Yeah, on the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's our uh, developers. Uh, like we said, East versus West is looking for a Q1 release somewhere next year. We'll see how that all pans out. But in the meantime, thank you all for watching. Be sure to tune in on next Thursday because we have something special yeah, coming up and as well. And it what? what? A cheer to all our developers. They're cheers. all across the world. Yes, they're all watching. Yeah. Yeah. They're hey, all watching. you guys are fantastic. We love you. Yeah. Absol absolutely. Thank you guys for coming out here today. I hope you, and, uh, I hope you enjoyed the stream, because uh, I certainly did. And uh, the QA is always great. But in the meantime, thank you all for watching. We're going to go away for today. And I uh, will be back with you next Thursday. And next week as well with more stuff. Maybe in the future we'll do some more East vs. West. Who knows? There's yeah. quite Thanks, a to go. Thanks, <laughs> Matt. See you guys online. See ya. See ya. seek the destruction of any government, nor do we covet a foot of any territory. We do not want an expanding struggle with consequences that no one can foresee, nor will we bluster or bully or flaunt our power, but we will not surrender.